you're talking about a festival of death selling, essentially, which encompasses 1,600 companies. Now, who is the company behind this festival that we are talking about? It goes by the name of Clarion Events, and it is led by a former officer in the RAF, Simon Kimball. Now, who owns Clarion Events? It is Blackstone Group. Now, in 2018, when you saw across the United States a massive reaction to school shootings and people calling for serious regulations upon the manufacturers of guns, Blackstone Group fell over themselves to announce to the world, we believe we have next to no direct exposure to the firearms industry. Well, today, Blackstone Group is the company that owns Clarion Events, and Clarion Events is holding this festival, which is not only featuring companies selling guns, it's featuring companies selling bombs, fighter jets, and warships. The people that work for Clarion Events and set up private companies for each one of these kind of events. So you have a private company, Dissy Limited. The trustees of it are Russell Stephen Wilcox, of course Simon Kimball, as was mentioned, Richard Johnson, and Monica Pahua, who is of course a data security, <laughs> a data security manager. So what we're talking about here is an entire economy that the DNA of it is based upon violence around the world. And it reaches up to the Defence Minister, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. When he talks about the British occupation of Afghanistan and his sorrow about the people that will left, be left behind, let's not forget that Ben Wallace was the overseas director of Kinetic. Kinetic is an arms company that profited in the billion through the British presence in Afghanistan. Ben Wallace is also funded by a lobbying firm by the name of Squire Patton Boggs. Now he received three payments from Squire, Squire Patton Boggs. Those three payments fell in 2016 and 2017. Now in those years Squire Patton Boggs was employed as a lobbyist for BAE Systems, the largest arms company in this country. We know that their contract finished in 2018, and since then, Mr. Ben Wallace has not received any payments from Squire Patton Boggs anymore. And it's not just that. In fact, the director of Squire Patton Boggs is James Thompson, who is the former in-house legal um, uh, lawyer for BAE Systems. So we are talking about an incestuous, revolving door relationship between people whose constituents are meant to be us. But actually their constituents are far more likely to be the companies that are inside that building now advertising their wares. What about the former Prime Minister, Theresa May? Well, her husband, Philip May, works for Capital Group. Capital Group, throughout the war on terror, have been the largest shareholder in Lockheed Martin and BAE Systems. Literally meaning that for every missile that is dropped by Lockheed Martins or BAE Systems material, Theresa May's husband's company benefited. Let's not forget that throughout the war on terror, stocks in Lockheed Martin increased in value by 1,200%. This war displaced 37 million people across the planet. Guess who? militarized the borders of the EU and the United States. Guess who benefited from that? Lockheed Martin, the very company that is partly owned by a company that Philip May works for. So the same companies that benefit from creating the refugees also benefit from preventing the peaceful passage of those refugees. And what about the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Richie Sunak? Where might he fall into all of this? Well, he was a partner at something called the Children's Investment Fund, which owned part of Lockheed Martin. One of the top shareholders in Lockheed Martin was the Children's Investment Fund, while Rishi Sunak 
was a partner at it. The other story which has been mangled by the mainstream media is this story about the biometric data of Afghans. Well, the United States, when they occupied Afghanistan, had the aim of collecting biometric data on 80% of the population in that country. Now, they attempted it through a company called Securometrics. Securometrics make the biometric machine through which they extract not only uh, fingerprints, but even the iris of Afghans. They attempted to extract value from. Now, who owns Securometrics? It's a company called Safran. The main shareholders in Safran are the French state and the Children's Investment Fund, for which Rishi Sunak worked for as well. What about Tony Blair? Well, Tony Blair is paid about a million pounds a year as an advisor for the Mubadala Development Fund. The Mubadala Development Fund, based in the UAE, have for across the last 10 years been talking about their intention to extract $1 trillion worth of minerals from Afghanistan. So what we are talking about is a political elite which is literally knee deep in money from these kind of companies. What about Serco? Well, everybody knows that the CEO of Serco is Richard Soomes. This is the grandson of Winston Churchill, who of course, during his time in what would become uh, the border of Pakistan, fighting Pashtuns, who later on from among them came the organization, the Taliban, he said that the Pashtuns had to accept the superiority of the British race. Well, his grandson, Nicholas Soomes, who's the CEO of Serco, has a wife, Camilla Soomes, who is a donor to the Conservative Party. Uh, former Health Minister Edward Argar is um, actually a former Serco lobbyist. Let's not forget that Serco provided logistics and base support for the Australian Army in Afghanistan, and also they are a major subcontractor on the Skynet 5 program, which is important to the Ministry of Defense and its network across the world. And even in the case where military bases were being disassembled in Afghanistan, guess who got the contracts to do that? Yes, it was Serco again, that company which is also connected to the Tory party. And what about the security for today's event? With the exception of our um, taxpayer-funded uh, people across the road, you have, of course, G4S, who are also taxpayer-funded too. But G4S, of course, as a company, collects £600 million in contracts from the British government uh, yearly. And let's not forget that one of their paid advisors is the former Defence Secretary, John Reid. The company that were tasked with doing the security for the US Embassy in Afghanistan, Armour Group, are owned by G4S. Now, Armour Group were found by the US government to have violated the Trafficking Victims Protection Act by visiting brothels in Kabul during their deployment to protect US embassies. What was their punishment? Well, all they had to do in the end was pay $7.5 million as a fine to the US government. Now, for a company like G4S, that gets 600 million pounds alone from the British government yearly in contracts. It's not really, it's not really going to put them out much, is it? <laughs> now, when we think about the connection, particularly today, between the state of Israel and the British state in terms of arms, the connection goes back far further than many might assume. So we know that in World War I, there was a company called the uh, Alfred Nobel Dynamite Company that had, a con it was kind of a conglomerate of four German companies and three British companies. From 1914 to 1916, this arms company sta stayed benefiting from every German person that died and every British person that died. This was at the very time when Britain was at war with Germany in World War I. Of course, in 1916, the conglomerate was forced to shut down. But what that meant is that for 50% of World War I, you literally had British arms dealers benefiting from British death and German arms dealers 
benefiting from German debt as part of a conglomerate, an arms company together. Patriotism doesn't exist to these people. It doesn't exist to these people. Now, what you then saw was the British in a position where they couldn't import vital materials that they needed for their war machine from Germany. So they called upon a chemist in Manchester by the name of Chaim Wiseman, who had a method through which acetone could be produced by the use of starch. And it was in that way, at a time when Winston Churchill was the Lord of the Admiralty and Balfour later replaced him, but Lloyd George was the Minister of Munitions. Lloyd George, who would later on go on to be the Prime Minister. Chaim Wiseman was called upon by the British state to demonstrate how he could produce the vital acetone for British weaponry. It was then that he was moved to um, uh, Addison Road, 67 Addison Road in Kensington, where he had his second child and where he grew closer and closer to the political elite of that time. And of course it was in 1917 that he was able to procure the Balfour Declaration from that very same British elite that he became close to through the arms trade and you had the establishment of the principle among those in the British government that they would establish separate institutions within Palestine and give the foundation of what would become the apartheid state that we know of today by the name of Israel. Meaning that there would be separate health institutions, separate schooling and separate other important public institutions for different parts of the population. A growing settler population but also the indigenous Palestinian population. Of course the British were essential in training the two leaders of both sides of the Zionist movement. Vladimir Jabotinsky on the right of the Zionist movement and Ben Gurion on the quote unquote left of the Zionist movement. These were two gentlemen that were trained by the British Army in World War I as part of a specific battalion um, of volunteers. Then you had the first High Commissioner of the British Mandate, Herbert Samuel, establish, like I said, the foundation of the apartheid state. Then in 1936, you had what would become the IDF formed by General Ord Wingate from the British Army, where he came and organized Zionist gangs to put down what was the longest strike in recorded human history, which was the Palestinian strike of 1936. During that time, you had 5,000 Palestinians killed, but you also had 2,000 Palestinian buildings demolished for punitive reasons. This was the establishment of something that we now today see the Israeli state do to Palestinians. In 1967, Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza could not have happened without the hundreds of Centurion tanks which were sold to them by Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister of Britain at the time. And even in 1973, you had the U UK Atomic Energy Authority undertake joint research with the State of Israel. Today, Israel has a nuclear arsenal. A lot of its work takes place in the settlement of Dimona. Now, was this collaboration that took place between the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the State of Israel in 1973 pivotal to that process? Well, we may never know. Today we're in a situation where Israel's largest arms company, Elbit, has 10 different sites across the UK. It has six subsidiaries in this country. Weapons that are produced here cannot be sent to any country around the world without the rubber stamp of the business secretary. And in fact, the arms trade treaty is very, very clear. If there is any risk that weapons may be used for serious violations of international humanitarian law, then they should not take place. Those are not my words. That is me directly quoting the arms trade treaty to which Britain is a signator. Now, when you have drones being produced, UAV tactical systems in Leicester, in a community which clearly doesn't want those drones to be produced, in its locality. When you have engines for those drones being produced next to Birmingham, again in a community that clearly doesn't want these weapons of war to be made there. When you have BAE Systems, the largest arms company in this country, in cooperation 
with an Israeli company, Raphael, to produce the naval drone which buttresses the siege of Gaza, a siege which many international bodies in the world condemn as illegal. You have to question whether these companies are engaged and complicit in very serious crimes. You also have the F-16 that Israel has used regularly to bomb an unarmed population in Gaza. Now, it contains HUD technology for targeting from BAE systems, which is produced in this country. You look at the F-35, the most expensive military project in the history of humanity. Over a trillion dollars has been spent on making this piece of hardware. BAE systems produce basically the entire rear section, and much of it is produced in this country. While the foreign minister, David Miliband, was asked in 2019 if he thought British components had been used in the war on Gaza that killed over 1,400 Palestinians, many of them children, he said, almost certainly. Now, why after that would Britain continue selling arms to this state if they adhere to the arms trade treaty? You have more than 100 companies in this country who sell military hardware, military equipment to the state of Israel. You even had when the Palestinians were attempting to practice their right under UN Resolution 194, the right to return, then be targeted by snipers in, by the Israeli occupation forces. Now that had taken place, that had taken place following the sales by the British government of arms components for snipers to the Israeli state. And guess what? Even after hundreds had been killed, thousands had been injured, many people with limbs amputated, the British government, in a clear violation of the arms trade treaty, continued to sell sniper components to the state of Israel. And then we get to the largest humanitarian crisis in the world today. We are talking about per capita, the poorest population in the world, in Yemen, which is being killed and bombed by the richest states in the region, backed by some of the richest countries that have ever existed. You're talking about 10 million people on the break, brink of famine. You're talking about 80% of the Yemeni population requiring humanitarian assistance. That's 24 million people. There are rates of acute malnutrition of children under five, which are the highest ever recorded. You have 98,000 children under the age of five at risk of dying without urgent treatment today. Quarter of a million pregnant or breastfeeding women are at risk of dying without urgent treatment today. And according to Save the Children, for every one child killed by bombs or bullets in Yemen, dozens starve to death. And let's not forget that starvation is a war crime. The depriving of civilians of objects which are indispensable to their survival. That is what qualifies as starvation in international humanitarian law. The Saudi Arabian military could not have done this to Yemen without BAE systems. Throughout this period of time, BAE systems has sold 15 billion pounds worth of arms to the Saudi government. During that time, you've seen ports blockaded, you've seen vital infrastructure bombed, you've seen farms bombed, you've seen health facilities bombed. And guess what? Overall, the biggest buyer of UK military hardware is the Saudi Arabian government. You have UK-made fighter jets driven by pilots who have been trained by the British dropping UK-made bombs from Typhoon and, to and tornado jets, they are dropping Paveley missiles and Brimstone missiles, which are made here in this country. And it's not only that that British personnel are doing, they are helping the Saudi pilots with targeting. They are in the command centers next to them. And in fact, at the height of this war, BAE Systems had 6,300 personnel inside Saudi Arabia specifically to help them with not only the maintenance of aircrafts, but also the targeting and reconnaissance. In fact, 
A BAE Systems worker was asked about how essential this maintenance is to the Saudi war on Yemen. And he replied that if you did not have our workers here doing maintenance on these fighter jets, within 7 to 14 days, you would not have a fighter jet in the sky. The Saudi Air Force has hit markets, funerals, weddings, detention facilities, civilian boats, and medical facilities. And let's not forget that throughout this pandemic, almost 50% of all health facilities within Yemen have been damaged or non-functioning. Even there was a cholera outbreak in 2016 after the Saudi Air Force with help from their British advisors targeted the sewer system and the sanitation system within Yemen. So what you see clearly are war crimes being carried out. You also saw the blockading by the Saudi military of Hudaydah. Now Hudaydah is the port through which 80% of Yemen's imports come. You also have the Saudis using British made cluster bombs that were sold in the 80s but are currently deemed to be illegal. But yet somehow only 49% of the population here know that the war in Yemen is even happening. Despite the fact that they are part of financial conscription to a war that they don't understand, that has nothing to do with them, in a place that most people here probably can't pronounce. How is it you are able to do this? How is it you are able to achieve this mass ignorance of the way our money is being used by those who are supposed to represent us? Well, you appoint as the person in charge of the Defence Committee in Parliament, which supposedly interrogates MOD policy, someone like Tobias Elwood. Well, who is Tobias Elwood? He is not only a member of Britain's Psychological Warfare Unit, the 77th Brigade. He is also someone that has received donations from the Saudi government and has also received donations from the Conservative Friends of Israel. Let's face it, guys, when it comes to MOD policy, the two most controversial things that the MOD does, the two most controversial places that this country sells weapons to, are Saudi Arabia and Israel. If you have somebody who is clearly beholden to these governments in an important position, like the chair of the defense committee that interrogates MOD policy, you live in a corrupt country. Let's be clear. What you also see is when the German government said, well, we don't want to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia anymore. We don't want to be complicit in the bombing of hospitals, markets, and funerals. Jeremy Hunt went over there and said to them, you know, you'll hurt BAE systems if you do this. He turned into a lobbyist for BAE systems. And it's not only Saudi Arabia, the UAE army have carried out airstrikes, but they've also been involved in torture, arbitrary detention, and forced disappearances in the south of Yemen. Now, there was a case that Kat took to the High Court in 2017. Unfortunately, they lost, but they came back in 2018, and in 2019, they won. It was made clear that British policy in regards to the arms trade treaty and the selling of weapons to Saudi Arabia was irrational and in fact unlawful. At that time, according to Liam Fox, there were 57 different arms licenses to Saudi Arabia under consideration. And so that victory in the courts in 2019 meant a serious, a serious um, gap in terms of how many weapons they could sell and when they could. Unfortunately, on the 7th of July 2020, the British government began again selling weapons to Saudi Arabia on the basis that they now had improved their methodology of deciding if something was likely to be used or might be used, sorry to use the correct term, terminology, in serious violations of international humanitarian law. And in fact, Liz Truss, the trade minister, at that time said there was no pattern of behavior on the part of the Saudi Air Force. She said these are aberrations and exceptional incidents. 
But let's not forget that Liz Trust has herself been funded by the American Enterprise Institute, which in turn is funded by the Koch brothers and Exxon Mobile at Melbourne, and is a well-known right-wing neoconservative think tank in the United States. On the 27th of October 2020, CAP have initiated a new challenge to this. However, this whole process of legally challenging what the government are doing in regards to weapon sales to Saudi have seen them not be able to procure fighter jets from the British government that they'd hoped to from 2015. But the point overall that I want to communicate to you all is that we have won before and we can and will win again. And what do I mean by that? You have, of course, the case in Australia where the Asia Pacific Defense and Security Exhibition, they attempted to hold it in 2008, but it was shut down as it had been in 1991 by the fear of protests. You also see that the Defense Procurement Research Technology and Exportability Arms Fair was originally chased out of Bristol and later out of Cardiff and Birmingham. You've also seen key victories take place in Glasgow, the very city that turned upside down when Lloyd, Lloyd George attempt to, attempted to visit it towards the end of World War I. And what about the 11 year struggle at Green Home Common? At one point, it was home to 96 US nuclear missiles. The Ministry of Defense promised that at Green Home Common, those missiles would quietly melt into the countryside. It was supposed to be a little piece of the USA in South England, which even had baseball pitches and many other key elements of cultural reference for the US military. But what happened? You had 11 years of struggle by women. They cut their way into the base. They broke into the base. They interrupted the passage of power. And actually, today, you no longer see US nuclear missiles at Greenham Common. But what you do see is a plaque marking the presence of the Greenham Common women's movement. And that is the poetic justice, my friends. As Thomas Paine said, time converts more than reason. And when you think about a society that allocates its funds in such needless and damaging and dangerous ways that benefit such a small slither of the society. When you think about the fact that the British economy right now is the fifth largest in the world, but within the next 10 to 15 years is falling to the 11th largest in the world. One of the last things that will go with that slide down economically will be the British arms trade. The 20 fastest growing economies in the world, none of them are in Europe and many of them are former British colonies. The sun is setting on the British Empire finally. And in the case of this arms fair, let's be absolutely clear, Blackstone Group is very sensitive to the suggestion that it has any type of complicity in the arms trade and the sale of guns, especially in the US context when you see the familiar faces appearing on CNN very tearful about the effects of school shootings. Well, what about what Blackstone Group is involved in today with 1,600 merchants of death here today selling their wares to representatives of over 100 states from around the world? Time is on your side. The attritional victories are still being achieved. Do not fear, we will win and they will lose. Thank you.